we're really excited you chose to spend some time with us. Um, many of you already know Peter Mullengarten, um, and some of you don't. So for those of you that don't, you're in for a real treat. So while you're getting um, certif certification, Peter is incredibly entertaining. Thank you, Lisa, uh, and welcome everyone uh, to this board certification course. As Jeff and Lisa both mentioned, and I'll mention it myself, um, we're not taking questions, not because I'm a jerk or I'm arrogant, or well, I've been accused of both. Um, it's just simply that we just don't have enough time because this course is incredibly comprehensive and it's full of material. Uh, and it doesn't do it justice to, unfortunately, to answer questions in, in this format. But as Jeff said, please submit your questions and we'll try to get back to you um, as soon as possible. With that being said, um, I am with K. Bender Rembaum. Uh, as they mentioned, I am a Florida Bar Board Certified Condominium Plan Unit Development Specialist, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and I've been doing this kind of practice law since 1984. So I've been doing it a long time, back when I had hair even. Um, and uh, I wanna welcome everyone here. Without any further ado, let's get going. Okay. And I'm gonna go through this uh, slide by slide. Uh, might not get through all the slides, um, but I'm going to do my best. Okay, why are we here? You're here because you are newly on the board, perhaps, or you just want to have a refresher course um, on uh, condo law. Basically, though, under the Florida statute, within 90 days after being elected or appointed to the board, or within one year before being elected or appointed, every condominium board of director must become certified. There's two ways to do that. You can submit a certificate of having satisfactorily completed an educational course taught by a, uh, a certified instructor, such as myself, or you can certify in writing to the secretary that you've read your documents, you will work to uphold those documents and policies to the best of your ability, and you'll faithfully discharge your uh, um, fiduciary responsibility to the association members. Now, you could do that in about five seconds, signing that certification. You won't learn a lot, but it would make you certified. Otherwise, you sit through a course like this, we'll send you a certificate and you will be certified. The certification does not have to be repeated as long as you serve on the board without interruption. When you go off the board and come back on though, you would have to be recertified. If you fail to submit the certification to the board, you're suspended from service and the board then can temporarily fill your position while you are suspended before you become certified. Those written um, certification forms or your educational certificate, they have the association has to keep those for at least five years or for the tenure on your board, whichever is longer. So if you serve on the board for three days, they have to hold those certificates for five years. You serve on the board for 10 years or eight years, they have to hold it for that amount of time. In the event that you're not certified, it does not affect, though, the things or the actions the board's taken during the period that a, a, that a director was not certified. All right, condo law. Condominiums basically are, what are they? They're airspace. They come in many shapes, many sizes. You go out west, you can have silos, grain silos, where they separate the silos into different um, condominium units. And early in my career in the Washington, D.C. area, I used to draft condominium documents Basically, anything that I can describe as a cube or an airspace, I can make into a condominium. Condominiums are creature of statute. So you cannot have a condominium with that type of ownership without a statute in the state enabling uh, one to own property in that manner, because you're literally you're owning airspace, as opposed to the old days where you'd have to own the land, the plot of land, and you get a deed. Now you get a deed, but you literally get a deed to airspace as described in the Declaration of Condominium. Again, it's buying a cube of air. Condominium Act in Florida is Chapter 718. I would suggest every board member, if you have some time, to read Chapter 718. It's not exactly the most thrilling document in the world in terms of uh, plot, but it will teach you a lot about operating your association because, quite frankly, that is, the, that is the thing that you need to know. That's what governs a lot of what you do is in Chapter 718, Florida Statutes. If there's conflicts between your documents, which are the Declaration of Condominium, the Articles of Incorporation or Bylaws, you have this old expression, a little dab will do you with an ad from the 50s. And basically the hierarchy is 
Declaration of Condominium, number one. Then it's the Articles of Incorporation, bylaws. And fourthly, it's not on the screen, is your rules and regulations. The rules and regulations are somewhat the caboose, but they're definitely enforceable if adopted properly. We, if we have enough time today, we'll get some things about rules and regulations. But that's the hierarchy of the documents. In the event of conflict, that's how it works. Deck controls over articles, articles control over bylaws, and deck controls over articles and bylaws and the rules. And you have to read all the documents together to, to determine whether or not there is a conflict because the courts will try, if they can, rather than declare a conflict, is trying to incorporate and read the documents together if possible. Kaufman language. Kaufman refers to a case many years ago dealing with rec leases. And the, what that case was about is what law, what substantive law affects your condominium. Uh, and basically, it's the, it's the Condominium Act that was in effect at the time that the association was created or the condominium was created. So if it's in the 80s, it's the act that was in, in it that was uh, in effect at that time. However, in the Kaufman case, which was a rec lease case, the declaration was subjected to the Condominium Act as amended from time to time. So when you have that language, that incorporates future amendments to the act with respect to your condominium, again, for substantive issues. Procedural issues, the act in effect today will affect procedural matters, but more substantive issues, you have to look to the law in effect when the declaration was recorded, or if there is this as amended from time to time language uh, in your declaration, which means it does incorporate future provisions of, of the act. What about conflicts? Your condominium association is most likely or very, very, very likely to be a chapter 617 Florida corporation, not for profit. That act does affect your condominium, although Chapter 718 will control and even any conflicts between Chapter 617, which is the Not-for-Profit Corporation Act, and Chapter 718, which, as I just mentioned before, is the Florida Condominium Act. Sometimes we have to look to 617 if Chapter 718 is silent or your bylaws may be silent. So sometimes we do have to look to, to Chapter 617 for certain issues regarding the operation of the association. Membership meetings. Okay. Most condominium associations have generally one membership meeting a year, but they can have more. The one that you have to have is your annual meeting. And your annual meeting uh, is a meeting of the owners as opposed to the board. So it's a membership or unit owner meeting. It must be held at the location that's set forth in the bylaws. If they're silent, then it must be within 45 miles of where the condominium is located. The bylaws must provide the method of calling the meeting and the election of directors must occur in connection with or in conjunction with your annual meeting. You can also have special member meetings, which are meetings other than the annual meeting. How are they called? Generally speaking, under most documents, the annual, the special member meeting generally can be called by the board, but you have to check out your documents. They can also typically be called by a petition of the owners. Um, they can be called by a petition of 10% of the owners unless a different percentage is set forth in your governing documents, typically in the bylaws. Members meeting, electronic notice. Under the statute, you can send notice of meetings electronically. What does that mean? Typically via email. Could also be facsimile for those out there still using fax machines. Um, but the owner has to agree in writing with the association to receive their notices of meetings by electronic uh, notice or uh, electronic transmission. Again, typically email. If an owner does that, then the association is required to maintain the email addresses or the facsimile numbers of all those who have consented to receive their notice in that way. We might get to this in a, later on, but basically, I'm going to say it now just in case we don't get there. Email addresses generally are privileged and not accessible to other owners in the condominium. However, if you have agreed or if owners have agreed to receive their notices by electronic transmission, notices of meetings, then those email addresses are accessible to other owners and are not privileged. Now, electronic notice cannot be used in a notice for a recall of a board member or for the retrofitting when you vote to retrofit or opt out of retrofitting uh, the association or the um, condominium with a fire sprinkler system. And any owners who have agreed to receive their meeting notices by email or by um, electronic transmission, it's their responsibility to make sure that their spam filters don't block that. In other words, the burden is not on the association to make sure they received it because of you know, a spam filter. It's the owner's responsibility to make sure that their system is not blocking the association's notice through email. 
members meetings of quorums. Quorum is what you need to conduct business as a membership meeting. So unless your documents, your bylaws have a lower number, the percentage votes needed to constitute a quorum is a majority of the voting interests, a majority, unless your documents have a lower number, and some do. Unless otherwise provided in the Condominium Act or by your documents, decisions to be made by the owners are made by a majority of those represented at a meeting in person or by proxy at which a quorum is present. So that's a sliding vote. In other words, that vote, it's not a majority of all, it's a majority of a quorum. So once you establish the quorum, then it's a majority of that. But the amount of votes you need, again, depends upon how many people are attending that meeting in person or, or by proxy in order to calculate what a majority of that number is. Members have a right to participate in all meetings on all designated agenda items on that notice. They have a right to speak, in other words, to all agenda items. The board, the association through the board, has the right and probably should adopt reasonable rules governing the frequency, duration, and manner of unit owner participation, such as you can't speak more than once on any agenda item for not more than three minutes in order to control the meeting, not to draconian control the meeting, but to control the meeting in a reasonable way. Owners are also allowed to record video or audio any meeting of the owners and of the board for that matter subject to reasonable rules, which the division allows. Now, back in the old days, like I've been around a long time, people used to come in with camera systems and camera setups. It was like Hollywood. And they had to set up in a certain place. So these rules, which aren't as used now because everyone uses their cell phones, but basically the rules can be that you have to set up your machines or your cameras ahead of time. And also uh, a rule that I would uh, encourage you to adopt is that you cannot move around the room while you do your videotaping. Uh, video recording, that you have to actually stay in your chair, stay in your seat, and not be disturbing others during the meeting. Proxies. This is very, very important. Spend a few minutes here. Voting by proxy. There's two types of proxies. A general proxy, which means I give my proxy holder general power to vote any way he or she wants to on my behalf, or a limited proxy, in which I, as the owner, for example, I'm telling my proxy holder, just, I'm instructing my proxy holder on the face of that proxy how to cast a vote on any issue. In Florida, any vote on a substantive matter, well, not including elections because you can't use proxies, but any vote on a substantive matter, he has to do a limited proxy. And there's a list, if you can see, as the various items or various issues that you need a limited proxy for. This is just an example, voting on waiver or a reduction of reserves, waiving the financial reporting requirements amendments to your declaration or your other documents, or any other matter which requires an owner vote, such as material alterations, which we may have time to get to today. So basically, in order to vote at a meeting through a proxy on a substantive issue, it has to be a limited proxy, again, where the owner is on that face of that proxy, instructing the proxy holder how to vote. So the proxy holder is basically a warm body. He or she is there representing me, but they can't exercise their judgment on how to vote for me because I am telling them on that proxy how to cast my vote. It's kind of like the first cousin of an absentee ballot. It's not an absentee ballot, but in terms of how it operates, it's very similar to that. As I mentioned, owners cannot vote by general proxy, but must vote by a, uh, a limited proxy. And the Florida Division of um, Condominiums, Timeshares, uh, and Mobile Homes has a form that, you, that the proxy must substantially uh, conform to. Now, proxies, limited and general, are used or can be used to count toward a quorum. Uh, there's no proxy voting in the election of directors, and we'll get to that. The election of directors does not permit using a proxy vote. It has to vote for directors, and the balloting for directors must be done by ballot cast by the unit owner. Now, proxies are only good for the specific meeting for which they're given, the proxy must indicate on the face of it the date, time, and place of the meeting for which it's given, but proxies also are good for 90 days. So one mechanism to use, for example, if you're voting on something, whether it's waiver of reserves, material alteration, or an amendment, if you don't think you have enough votes to get the thing passed, rather than counting the votes and saying, okay, we don't have enough, you can actually take a motion to adjourn and reconvene the meeting, X days later, and those proxies are good for 90 days, so they would be good for that reconvening of the meeting, and in the meantime, you can go out and solicit more proxies, so hopefully to adopt or pass 
whatever action is that you're hoping that your membership will uh, uh, adopt or approve. Speaking of elections, election of directors, unless your documents have otherwise, the board is five members. If the documents are silent, it's five, except for small condominiums of five or less units, then the board consists of three. A vacancy on the board caused by the expiration of a director's term must be filled by an election. The terms of all board members expire at the annual meeting, and such members may stand for re-election unless otherwise provided by the bylaws. Um, if there's a staggered term, in other words, you have directors serving staggered two-year terms or staggered three-year terms, and obviously those, those, uh, uh, those terms of office do not expire at the next meeting. They expire at the end of that two- or three-year term. Um, if all directors' terms would expire and there are no candidates provided by the bylaws or, or, or articles, the board members serve, you can serve longer than one year. So basically that means the terms would roll over. So in, in essence, five member board, no candidates, the five would roll over. However, as of July 1st, 2018, a director cannot serve more than eight consecutive years unless elected by the affirmative vote of owners representing two thirds of all votes cast in election. Now that doesn't mean two thirds of all the votes in the association. That means two thirds of the number of people actually voted. If you got two thirds of all the votes that were actually cast, then that would overcome that eight year term limit. Secondly, the eight year term limit is also overcome if there are not enough, el uh, if there are not enough eligible candidates to fill the vacancies on the board at the time of the vacancy. Uh, now there was some question at one time whether this eight year term applied retroactively. In other words, I've been on the board for 20 years. Can I continue to serve or am I now off because of this eight-year term limit? And the legislature finally clarified this in 2018 by saying that the eight years, basically, it's the term of office on or after July 1st, 2018. That's what counts towards the eight-year term limit. If there are uh, the same or fewer number of candidates as vacancies on the board, then there is no election and those people are automatically elected by acclamation. Again, they all have to be eligible to serve, but if you have the same or fewer number of candidates, then there is no election and they're on the board. Candidate, who's eligible? All right, some people seem to think, and I go to a lot of meetings, that to be on the board, you must be an owner. Well, not necessarily true, okay? A candidate is an eligible person who has timely submitted the notice. What's an eligible person? Well, we'll look at, we'll get to some of the eligibility uh, requirements in a minute, but what I wanted to mention is that unless your documents limit board members to being owners, then they're not limited just to owners. Your, your documents can limit board members to being owners, but the statute does not limit board members to being owners. That has to be something that is limited through your governing documents. Now, assuming that you are eligible, either as an owner or otherwise, depending upon your documents, then to serve on the board or to run for the board, you have to submit your notice of intent to run for the board not later than 40 days prior to the annual meeting and the election where the election will, will take place in order to be on the ballot. And this is a very strict, hard deadline. It's not later than 40 days. And the burden is on the owner or other eligible person submitting their name to basically show or prove that they submitted it timely. Uh, and that's why the state recommends, it doesn't require, but it recommends that these notice of intents be submitted by certified mail, return receipt requested, or by hand delivery, because by law, if it's hand delivered, the association must give you a receipt for turning that in. And there's a couple of cases out there, I won't go into too much detail, but in one case, someone swore up and down that they slid their intent under the manager's door, you know, at 11.59 on the eve of the, you know, of the, of the deadline, and that person was not allowed to run because they could not prove they actually did deliver their notice of intent on time. Like I said, the burden is on the owner to show that he delivered it timely. Eligibility, here are some of the eligibility requirements. Uh, anyone who's convicted of a felony um, and has not had their civil rights restored for at least five years as of the date they're trying to seek election, they're not eligible. If you've been suspended or removed by the division, uh, you're not eligible. Anyone who's delinquent in the payment of any assessment, this used to be monetary obligation was changed to assessment, any person who is delinquent in the payment of any assessment as of the deadline to submit your name is not on the ballot. So if you're delinquent in the payment of any assessment or maintenance obligation to the association as of that deadline to submit your name, you're not permitted to be on the ballot, even if you become current, let's say the following day. 
And finally, we have co-owners. So in a residential condominium association of more than 10 units, okay, co-owners of a unit, could be husband and wife, could be brothers, whatever, may not serve on the board simultaneously unless they own more than one unit or there are not enough eligible candidates to fill the vacancies on the board. The deadlines, okay. The association must send out their first notice of the annual meeting at least 60 days before the annual meeting and the election, okay. That notice actually must list or have set forth on there the address, the mailing address of the association. As I mentioned, anyone who wants to be a candidate has to submit their written notice of intent at least 40 days before the election. As an option, any candidate can also uh, submit an information sheet about himself or herself that has to be on a sheet of paper, no larger than eight and a half by 11. Some people call these resumes, other names. The technical name is information sheet. Now that has to be furnished by the candidate if they're gonna do it, not less than 35 days before the election. That these information sheets, to the extent they are, they are submitted by candidates, must be included with the second notice of the meeting along with the ballot. If they're not, or if any candidate information sheet is missing, then that election can be declared invalid if challenged. And that, and actually that person would win because that's one of the uh, fatal flaws in the, in, in the election process. Again, the information sheet not required, it's optional um, on the part of the candidate and the board, the association cannot modify, amend or change those information sheets. No matter how nasty they may be or how many terrible things they may say, and I've heard stories about it, um, they have to be included, even if they call everyone on the board a poop head or whatever they do, um, you just realize that you have to include those information sheets, um, even if you might be offended by it, that's, on the, that's the problem of the candidate who submitted it. Now, not less than 14, nor more than 34 days, and why it's a 34? Because the information sheet deadline is the 35th day. So not less than 14, nor more than 34 days before the annual meeting, um, the second notice goes out with the written notice, the agenda, and uh, the ballot. The ballot must list all the candidates alphabetically by surname or by last name. The ballot cannot indicate who's an incumbent. In fact, nothing that the association mails out can say anything pro or con, good or bad, about any candidate, and it can't even indicate who's an incumbent on the board. Candidates themselves can do their own campaigning, but the association has to, you know, play the uh, play Switzerland, be neutral um, with respect to uh, what's sent out to the owners with respect to the uh, election. So it's the ballot, the information sheets, and the ballot listing the candidates by alphabetical order by last name. What about quorum? We mentioned quorum before. Those are for other actions, but in election, there is no reform requirement, except that at least 20% of the eligible voters must cast a ballot in order to establish a quorum for an election. It's not really a quorum, but to have a ballot election. So 20% of the eligible voters cast, so it's a pretty low bar or low standard. If the association owns any units, it doesn't vote. It doesn't vote for those units. So if it's acquired units through foreclosure or otherwise, it doesn't vote for those units. If there's other business being conducted at the annual meeting, voting on amendments, maybe voting on material alteration or something like that, voting on the audit requirements, those issues you do have to have a quorum for, but not for the election. The elections are decided by a plurality of the votes. In other words, who gets the most votes? You don't have to get a majority. You have to get a plurality. It's by a secret ballot. Um, I'll mention in a second how that secrecy is done. No proxy voting. We mentioned that before. Uh, you have to cast your own ballot unless you're disabled and you need assistance, and then you can have assistance uh, to the extent that you need it. Um, all the voting records, ballots, sign-in sheets, any proxies, all the documents must be retained by for at least one year as part of the association's official records. And finally, any challenge to an election must be occur, must be commenced within 60 days after the election are announced. So if the association does mess up the process, and does everything wrong, theoretically, okay? But on the 61st day, it's like they did everything right because that's the deadline to challenge the election 60 days after that night or after that day when the, uh, uh, when the results are announced. Now, I mentioned these are secret ballots. How they're secret ballots is because it's a two envelope system and 
There's a committee appointed by the board of people who are not board members, not officers, not candidates or any spouses of those people. Okay, this committee, their job basically is to verify the information on the election ballots, the outer and the um, the outer envelope that we'll talk about in a second, and also to count the votes. So this committee, they meet either on the same day as the election, and in that case, but earlier in the day or night. You know, in that case, they have to post notice or the association has to post notice that the committee is meeting. That notice is posted 48 hours in advance, like a board meeting, and the owners are allowed to attend and watch the committee do their thing. Or the committee can check in the ballots and uh, that now not count the ballots. This is check in the ballots. They can't count the ballots at this earlier meeting, but that's when they verify. Or they can verify the ballots at the annual meeting itself in front of all the other owners. What are they doing? They're checking the outer envelope information. What goes on the outer envelope? The outer envelope has the name of the owner, the unit number, and a signature line. Okay, so basically, what the, that's what this committee is doing. They're basically checking to make sure that that outer envelope has been signed by the owner. Um, but they don't open the ballots until the actual uh, counting occurs at at the meeting. You can also have electronic voting or online voting. I'll try to go through this relatively quickly. In online voting, you're voting through. Uh, the internet on an online system through software that the association can purchase. So there's two methods here. You can vote, you know, through hard copy ballots put into the inner envelope, which just says ballot. The inner envelope with the ballot goes into the outer envelope. The outer envelope gets signed, and then it gets verified and eventually open and counted at the annual meeting or electronic voting. Uh, the association can adopt electronic voting with a 14-day notice uh, the board meeting notice at which they're going to adopt electronic voting. If you do have electronic voting, anyone casting a vote electronically is counted for a quorum purposes. Uh, like I said before, it has to be established by board resolution with the notice of that meeting going out 14 days in advance by mail and posted. Um, the resolution must provide that the owners will receive notice of the opportunity to vote through an online voting system. The resolution must also establish reasonable procedures and deadlines for owners to provide their written consent um, to voting uh, uh, through uh, electronic means and establish reasonable procedures and deadlines for owners to opt out. In fact, every time they do an, an online vote, basically owners are provided a, a opportunity to opt out and vote the old fashioned way or to vote uh, electronically. If an online voting is used, each owner must be provided with a method to authenticate their identity a method to ensure the secrecy and integrity of the election ballots for directors, a method to confirm at least 14 days before the voting deadline that the owner's electronic device can will successfully communicate with the online system. The system must be able to authenticate the owner's identity, authenticate the validity of each vote cast electronically, and make sure it's not hasn't been altered in transit, transmit a receipt to each owner who casts a vote online, and permanently separate any authentication or, or identifying information from the electronic ballot, rendering it impossible to tie an election ballot to any owner and store and keep the electronic votes accessible to election officials for recount, inspection, and review, because everybody gets to potentially or theoretically, if they want to, inspect the uh, votes. What happens if everyone quits? Yeah, not good, but basically, if there's vacancies on the board, that are uh, created in between meetings or in between elections. And that could be any by death, resignation, disqualification. For example, if, if directors are supposed to be owners or have to be owners uh, and they've sold or lost their unit. So basically, if there's a vacancy that occurs uh, on the board before the expiration of a term, basically under the Condominium Act, unless otherwise provided by the bylaws, then those vacancies can be filled by an affirmative vote of the majority of the remaining directors, even if it's less than a quorum, or even if it's only one remaining director. So again, vacancies created as a result as a result of resignation or death or something like that, unless the bylaws provide otherwise, the remaining board members fill those vacancies. As far as how long do those directors serve, again, unless otherwise provided by the bylaws, those replacement directors serve for the balance of the term for the director that they are replacing or the seat that they are filling. Recall a little different, but based, but for non-recall vacancies, uh, this is what governs. 
officers. Now, unlike board members, under almost every set of bylaws I've ever read, which is a fair number, um, the officers are elected by the board. Unless otherwise provided in your bylaws, you have to have a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Unless otherwise provided in your bylaws, they serve without compensation and at the pleasure of the board, or more likely displeasure, because the board, like I said, under most bylaws, the board elects the officers, appoints the officers, and can remove them from office. Not remove them from the board. Okay, that can only be done by the owners in a recall, but as far as they can take a president or treasurer or whoever out of their office, they're still on the board, but they no longer hold their office and they could be replaced by another officer. Um, now, directors are prohibited from voting by proxy or secret ballot, except for the election of officers. That's the only exception when they can use secret balloting uh, for voting by board members. So they can elect their officers by secret ballot. Otherwise, there is no secret ballots used in the uh, uh, director votes. And again, there's no prohibition against changing officers midstream. I'm not saying you should, um, but it is, it is an option available. Um, some, some brief tips. Um, you may want to notice a board meeting prior to the election to conclude any unfinished business from the prior board. Usually the organizational meeting, in other words, the meeting when the board elects their officers, typically that occurs immediately after the annual meeting, but it still has to be noticed. So you post notice um, at least 48 hours in advance that the board is going to meet after the annual meeting to have an organizational meeting to elect their officers. <clears throat> and a little note there, does the president vote? The reasons that's there is I get questioned a lot that, or I get told a lot, well, in our condo, or the president only votes to break a tie. Well, if the president is also a board member, which he or she usually is, the president votes because all the board members vote. You know, it doesn't make a difference what office you hold. Every director votes uh, no matter what office he or she holds. Speaking of board members, board members. Board members have a fiduciary responsibility. Fiduciary, big, fancy, long word, basically for trust. Okay, they're in a position of trust to the membership. They don't always have to be right, okay? They have to exercise their reasonable business judgment, which means if a director is acting in good faith with the best interests of the association at heart and not acting in self-interest or some kind of fraud or other shenanigans, then even if they, their decisions turn out to be, for lack of a better word, wrong or not, or not the best decision, they're protected you know, from any liability because they exercise their reasonable business judgment and were acting in good faith, okay? Directors are not compensated, i.e. not paid, unless otherwise provided in the bylaws, um, unless it's, you know, it's for some kind of work that they're doing for the association for which they do get paid. But in that case, that's a conflict of interest that needs to be worked out properly and approved properly. Um, uh, different topic. Uh, and finally, no board member, not even the president, makes unilateral decisions. The board acts as a body. And the board acts, you know, based on consensus or based on, you know, the vote of the board and no individual board member, you know, runs or operates the association. Association operated, operated through its board as a group, group decision. Um, ratification is a method that is used sometimes uh, when a board inadvertently made a decision without meeting or because of exigent circumstances had to make a you know, some quick decision uh, or just, you know, whatever, didn't have a board meeting. So then the board can meet to ratify that decision. That is legal. I would not use it as a method of operation, okay, as a crutch, because generally speaking, board decisions must be made at board meetings at which a quorum of the board is present, either in person or remotely. Um, you know, but every now and then it's okay to ratify actions that the board took without a board meeting. Won't go through this too much. Don't take any kickbacks. Don't take any uh, unjust um, uh, things um, uh, or uh, any kind of consideration. Uh, basically, you know, all that is you know, obviously bad news. Um, you could be liable for civil or even criminal penalties. Hopefully, everyone watching, listening, you know, this is not going to apply to them. But just be aware that uh, you know, no improper benefits can be uh, uh, garnered 
by a board member um and he has to act in the, he or she act in the best interest of the corporation now board members they can't communicate with each other by email you cannot vote by email but in the statute in the kind of mini mac you can communicate to each other by email but you cannot again cast a vote by email for most board meetings most it's a 48 hour notice of the board meeting posted conspicuously on the condominium property that notice must have the date, time, place, and agenda for the board meeting that's posted. There are a couple other things that you can do a non-48 hour notice for, and we'll get to that um, in a second. Right now. When do you need to have a 14-day notice? Well, there's three things. One of them is what I just mentioned before about when you're doing um, electronic voting, when you're adopting um, electronic voting, that's a 14-day notice. But more typically, or I won't say more importantly, but more typically, is these other two items that need the 14-day notice. When you're adopting a non-emergency special assessment, okay, or you're adopting or amending a rule regarding the use of a unit. For these type of board actions, okay, the board needs to post the notice of that meeting 14 days in advance, and it must be posted on the property 14 days in advance. Uh, and the person who's providing that notice, sending that notice, posting that notice on behalf of the association, he or she must sign an affidavit providing that the notice was provided to the owners in accordance with these requirements. And these are both crucial because if you want to collect a special assessment, um, at least my firm, we're going to require that you provide us the backup, backup showing that that special assessment that you want collected because maybe the owner hasn't paid it that you've gone through the 14 day notice. I wanna see that notice. I wanna see the affidavit that the notice was sent out properly, the minutes of the board meeting, et cetera. So it's very, very important that that's done. Similarly, if you wanna uh, enforce a rule regarding the use of a unit as opposed to the common elements. I also wanna see the backup that that rule was adopted properly with the 14 day notice or the rule was amended. As I mentioned, the board meeting must uh, identify all the agenda items, except in an emergency. By the way, it has to be a bona fide emergency, not just all the directors are leaving next week because it's the end of season. You know, emergencies are emergencies, whether it's a hurricane or some other dire event, it has to be a, a true emergency. Now, owners, 20% of the owners, they can petition the board to address an item. Uh, if the board does get that type of petition for an item to be put on the agenda, then within 60 days after receipt of the petition, they must place the item on the agenda at its next board meeting or call a board meeting. So within 60 days, either at the call a board meeting or at the next meeting within that time, put that item on the agenda. It doesn't mean the board has to do whatever it is that the owners are, are requesting, but the issue, the item must be on the agenda. Um, now, I mentioned before that the board can only address items that are on the agenda that's posted. You can bring up an item on an emergency basis that's not on the agenda by a majority plus one of the board. So if it's a five person board, let's say for example, a majority plus one would be four directors can basically adopt the motion, adding something to an agenda at a meeting on an emergency basis. However, that emergency action must be noticed and ratified at the next board meeting. So it could be brought up as an emergency at, at, at the meeting tonight, for example, but then it must be ratified at the next board meeting on the notice. I mentioned before that special assessments, um, that the notice must be 14 days in advance, posted as well as sent to the owners. That notice of a meeting when you're going to adopt a special assessment or consider the adoption of a special assessment must specifically state that assessments will be considered and provide the estimated cost and description of the purposes for such assessments. That's also crucial in terms of making sure that the assessment is going to be collectible. Members, as I mentioned before, with unit owner meetings, little board, meeting, board meetings, same thing, the owners have the right to speak on any designated agenda item. Now, there's two types of meetings that can be closed, two types and two types only. Meetings between the board or a committee with the association's counsel or attorney with respect to proposed or pending litigation, if the meeting is held for the purpose of seeking or rendering legal advice on that matter, or 
the board is meeting for the purpose of discussing personnel matters. Now, even though these meetings can be closed to the owners, they are still required to be noticed because the law does not exempt them from the notice requirements. It simply exempts them from the open meeting requirements as far as owners being allowed to attend. Owners can record audio or video, any meeting of the board. And similarly, like I mentioned before, you can have rules regarding uh, the manner of that recording as long as they're reasonable. And the board can adopt and probably should adopt written reasonable rules governing the frequency, duration, and manner of owner statements. Like I said before, can't speak on you know more than one agenda, excuse me, can speak on every agenda item for not more than say three minutes. But they are allowed to speak on any agenda item. What's a quorum? A majority of the board present at a meeting constitutes a quorum. You can be present either in person or if you have the means, you can also be present telephonically or remotely, whether it's Zoom like we're doing right now or Skype. Um, the important thing there is that everyone who's participating in that meeting or attending that meeting, both board and owners, they all have to be able to hear each other. So board members attending remotely through uh, a teleconference or through a Zoom, everyone in the room at that meeting has to be able to hear everyone who's participating remotely and vice versa. And the board members, they can vote remotely too. So if they're attending, again, speakerphone or Zoom or something like that, they're allowed to vote um, in that manner. Not, not by email, but you know, over the speakerphone or through the Zoom. The action of a majority of the directors present at a meeting at which a quorum can be attained or has been attained is the action of the board. Again, unless your documents require for some reason a higher vote or a higher uh, approval for certain actions. As I mentioned before, directors cannot vote by proxy or by secret ballot, but they can vote by secret ballot when they're electing their officers. Um, you also are required to record in the minutes how every director voted or if they abstained on every issue. So it isn't proper just to say the resolution passed four to three or the resolution was defeated four to three. You have to indicate how every director voted and whether it's a yes, a no, or an abstention. A director who is present at a meeting at which an action or a matter is taken is a, presumed to have assented to the action unless they vote against it or abstains from voting. Anyone who abstains is presumed to have taken no position on the matter or on the issue. If a member of the board or a committee submits in writing his or her agreement or disagreement with any action that the board or, or the committee took that that member did not attend, that agreement, that written can basically uh, ascension may not be used as a vote for or against that action and is not counted towards a quorum. Committee meetings, and this is something that I think a lot of associations inadvertently uh, don't comply with in terms of committee meetings and when they're open or when they're closed. Uh, basically, your budget committee and any committee that is authorized to take final action on behalf of the board, which probably isn't that frequent, if at all, but those committees, their meetings must be open and must be noticed in the same manner as a board meeting. So a committee that's making recommendations about the uh, about the budget or a committee for whatever reason is authorized to take final action, those meetings must be noticed, posted, and open to the membership. The other committees, in other words, the, other than the budget one and the final action committee, the other committees are also required to have their meetings open and uh, with the proper notice posted unless your bylaws exempt them from having to do so. So basically, then all the committees must meet in the same manner as the board with the same type of notice unless your bylaws exempt these other committees. You can't exempt the committee regarding the budget and you can't exempt any committee authorized to take final action from those notice requirements. How to get off the board. You guys just got on the board. <laughs> but uh, basically, as far as being removed or getting off the board, I, there's resignation, recall, if you're delinquent in any monetary obligation for more than 90 days, you're more than 90 days delinquent, then you've abandoned your office. Any criminal charges, not conviction, 
but a criminal charge involving theft or embezzlement off the board until those charges have been cleared up or dropped for a knowing in the willful or willing violation of the condominium act the division may order your removal if you're not certified like you're doing this afternoon then you're suspended you're not removed but you're suspended until your uh your certification has been accomplished also if the board finds an officer or director has violated conflict of interest disclosures then that person can all is also deemed to be removed from office okay milestone inspections mandatory structural inspection for economy cup this is spent a little time here um unfortunately tragically all of you know or should know uh what happened down at surfside with the collapse of uh, champlain tower south and the, and the tragic death of 98 uh people um the reaction to that the aftermath of that was the adoption of these statutes and i'm about to talk about these were adopted last year the legislature is meeting right now considering some proposed changes to these but for the time being this is the law as of today regarding these issues so it's two things milestone and structural integrity reserves and we're going to start with the milestone inspection a milestone inspection is a structural inspection of a building including an inspection of load-bearing walls and primary structural members and primary structural systems those are defined in section 627.706 of florida statutes now the milestone inspection basically the purpose of this is to determine the current condition of the building and to make sure to try to make sure there is no substantial structural deterioration the milestone inspection must be carried out by a licensed architect or engineer authorized to practice in florida and again it's for the purpose of attesting to the life safety and adequacy of the structural components of the building and to the extent possible or the extent reasonably possible determining the general structural condition of the building as it affects the safety of the building including a determination of any necessary maintenance repair or replacement of any structural component of the building please note that the milestone inspection is not intended to determine if the building complies with the florida building code the purpose of it is to determine whether the building is structurally sound basically now substantial structural deterioration is which, which is what the milestone is trying to attempt to, to detect or to uh, determine that is uh, substantial structural distress that negatively affects a building's general structural condition and integrity it doesn't include minor things like surface imperfections cracks distortion sagging deflection appealing unless the engineer or the architect performing the phase one we'll talk about phase one phase two in a second unless the licensed engineer or, or architect performing the phase one or phase two determines that such surface imperfections are a sign of substantial structural deterioration but that's the engineer or the architect's uh decision determination now what it, what condominium buildings or cooperative buildings are subject to this a condominium association under 718 chapter 718 or cooperative under chapter 719 must have a milestone inspection performed for every building that is three or more stories in height and this inspection must be completed by December 31st of the year in which the building reaches 30 years of age but there is a starting point uh with I'll mention in a second for buildings that are you know 30 34 35 years old right now the age of the building is determined by the date that the certificate of occupancy was issued and additional milestone inspections after the initial one must be done every 10 years if a building is more than three stories in height and is within three miles of the coastline then the association condominium or cooperative must have a milestone inspection performed by December 31st of the year in which the building reaches 25 years of age okay and then every 10 years after that the association condominium or cooperative must arrange for the inspection is responsible for compliance and for the costs I mentioned though that there's a kind of a starting gun here if a milestone inspection is required and the building co certificate of occupancy was issued on or before july 1st 1992 
then your initial milestone inspection must be performed but before December 31st, 2024. If the issuance date or the date of issuance of the certificate of occupancy is not available, then the date shall be the date of occupancy evidence in any record of the local building official. So the key here is if your building was 30 years old on or before July 1st and it's three stories or more, or if you have buildings three stories or more, for each of those buildings that were 30 or more years old of, as of July 1st, 1992, your initial milestone must be performed before December 31st, 2024, milestone inspection. Now, the local enforcement agency, which could be the building department most likely, okay, they also keep track of the ages of the buildings and the size of the buildings in their jurisdiction. They're required to provide, to provide written notice of an inspection to the association by certified mail return receipt requested. Within 180 days receiving notice, you're, you're required to complete your phase one milestone, milestone inspection or not later than December 31st, 2024, which is the outside date. The licensed engineer architect who's practiced, uh, authorized to practice in Florida, you know, what is the completion? It's when that engineer, it's when an architect has submitted their inspection report to the local enforcement agency. And they also have to submit their report to the association. We'll get to that in a second. That's submitted by email, US mail, or commercial delivery service. Now, there's two, whoops, there's two phases of this, a phase one or phase two. The phase one, the architect or the engineer does a visual inspection of the habitable and non, and non habitable areas of the building. Again, buildings that are three stories or more in height, including the major structural components of the building. And then they provide or he or she provides a qualitative assessment of the structural condition of the building. If the architect or the engineer finds no sign of substantial structural deterioration to any building components, pursuant to that visual examination, then there is no phase two needed. So basically the phase one, the engineer, the architect, they inspect the building, he or she inspects the building. If they determine no structural, substantial structural deterioration, then there is no phase two and you're done with respect to the milestone inspection until 10 years you know, thereafter. However, a phase two, inspection, milestone inspection must be performed if any substantial deterioration is identified in the phase one inspection. Now the phase two inspection may involve destructive or non-destructive testing. That's at the inspector's discretion. So the architect or the engineer, they determine the level or amount of inspection or testing for the phase two. Remember the phase one is just a visual. The phase two can be much more involved in terms of destructive or non-destructive testing. The inspection may be as extensive or as limited as necessary to fully assess the areas of structural distress in order to confirm whether the building is structurally sound and to recommend a program for fully assessing and repairing any distressed or damaged portions of the, of the building. In doing that, if they're gonna be doing destructive testing, the inspector is required to give preference to locations that are as the least disruptive and most easily repairable uh, while, still, while still being representative of the condition of the structure of, of the building. An inspector who completes phase two must also prepare and submit an inspection report. Upon completion of either a phase one or a phase two milestone inspection, the engineer who did it or the architect must submit a sealed copy of the entire report with a separate summary, it was a shorter version, a separate summary of at a minimum, the material findings and recommendations in the report to the association and to the building official. So both the association gets the full report and that summary, as well as the building official. <coughs> Excuse me. Now a local enforcement agency, i.e. the building department or other agency with jurisdiction, they can prescribe timelines and penalties with respect to compliance with these milestone inspection requirements. And the Board of County Commissioners can adopt a resolution, excuse me, an ordinance requiring that the association schedule or commence the repairs in a specified time frame after they get a phase two. However, 
those repairs must be commenced within 365 days after receiving the report. If the association fails to submit proof to the government agency, to the enforcement agency, the repairs have been scheduled or have commenced for any substantial structural deterioration, which is identified in the phase two within the required time frame, then that local enforcement agency must review and determine whether the building is safe or unsafe for occupancy. What happens when the board gets these reports? You don't just toss them in the drawer. Upon the completion of a phase one or a phase two milestone inspection uh, and receipt of the summary, the association must distribute a copy of the summary, again, not the whole report, must distribute a copy of the inspector prepared summary to each owner, regardless of what the findings are, by US mail or personal delivery and by electronic transmission to those owners who have agreed to receive their, uh, their notice in, in that manner. The associate must also post a copy of the summary in a conspicuous place on the condominium or the co-op property. And if you have a website, publish the full report on the association's website. Remember, certain associations, those with 150 or more units, must have a website and must post the report, uh, the full report and the summary on the website. Who pays for it? As we mentioned before, this is an association expense. So it's a common expense of the association to pay for the phase one and if needed, the phase two milestone inspection, as well as all costs associated with the inspection. What's the downside or consequence of not performing the inspection? Well, among other things, if the officers of the association or directors willfully and knowingly fail, excuse me, to have the milestone inspection performed, such failure is a breach of the officer director's fiduciary relationship to the owners. And a breach of fiduciary relationship, knowingly and willfully, is probably not going to be covered by your directors and officers' insurance. There is an exemption, okay, at least currently there is an exemption. The otherwise required model inspection do not apply to a single family, two family, or three family dwelling with three or fewer habitable stories above ground. The other component of this new law adopted last year or amended into this law last year is the structural integrity reserve study and mandatory reserves. As I mentioned, post surfside we have milestone. Milestone is to determine the current condition of the buildings <clears throat> which must, which are subject to it, which is buildings three stories or more in height and 30 years more of age or 25 years or more of age if they're within three miles of a coastline. The structural integrity reserve study is what they've placed into the law to try to prevent or try to, you know, future de substantial de deterioration by mandating certain reserves so the association will have the funds to make necessary repairs. So there's the current condition and then the reserves to hopefully prevent those conditions from occurring in the future. So structural integrity reserve study, or otherwise known as SERS. This is a study of the reserve funds required for future major repairs and replacement of the common areas based on a visual inspection of the common areas applicable to all condominiums and cooperatives buildings three stories or higher, similar to the milestone. But here we don't have the 30 year provision. At a minimum, okay, the SERS or the Structural Integrity Reserve Study uh, is a study of the following items related to the structural integrity and safety of the building. And these are things that must be covered. Now this might change with the new statutes that are being talked about in Tallahassee right now, but currently, this is what we have to focus on because it's the current status of the law. So here are the items, the roof, load-bearing walls and other primary structural members, floor, foundation, fireproofing and fire protection systems, plumbing, electrical systems, waterproofing and exterior painting, windows, and any other item that has a deferred maintenance or replacement expense cost that exceeds $10,000 and the failure to replace or maintain such item negatively affects the items listed above, one through nine, as determined by the licensed engineer architect performing the visual inspection of the Structural Integrity Reserve Study. So at a minimum, the Structural Integrity Reserve Study must include these items. 
They can be performed by any person qualified to perform this study. However, the visual portion of the structural integrity reserve study must be by an engineer or architect licensed in the state of Florida. So an engineer or architect can perform the, or must perform the visual inspection. A reserve specialist, a certified reserve specialist, um, a reserve consultant can also though assist in actually preparing the study, which includes you know, the uh, items that we're gonna talk about right here in the third bullet point, which is that it must identify the common areas or common elements that are being inspected, the estimated remaining useful life, and the estimated replacement or deferred maintenance expense of those areas being inspected, and a recommended annual reserve amount that achieves the estimated replacement cost or deferred maintenance expense of each common area being inspected by the end. So basically, they have to figure out for each of these components, what is the current condition? What is the estimated life? What's the estimated remaining life? What's the cost to do the re uh, estimated deferred uh, maintenance or replacement? And figure out how much has to be reserved every year. So in the year that each of those components uh, reaches the end of its life, there'll be sufficient funds to do that work, to do the replacement or to do the, the deferred maintenance. The amount to be reserved for an item is determined by your most recent structural integrity reserve study. Again, and these must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Again, this is for every condominium, every co-op building that is three stories or more in height. If the amount to be reserved for an item is not in your initial or most recent structural integrity, uh, structural integrity reserve study, or you haven't completed it, uh, the amount must be computed by using a formula based upon the estimated remaining useful life and the estimated replacement cost or deferred maintenance expense of each item, which is the which is the way that we've been doing reserves for years. The association may adjust your replacement reserve amounts annually, take into account any changes in estimates or extension of useful life. And some things have occurred where the useful life now has been extended, the life has been extended, that can be taken into account on an, on an annual basis. Now, importantly, on the second bullet point here, if the association fails to complete a SERS, Structural Integrity Reserve Study, such failure is a breach of the officer's director's fiduciary relationship. Remember on the milestone, it was willful and knowing was a breach of fiduciary duty? Well, for SERS, they even took out willful and knowing. If you fail to do it, that in and of itself is a breach of fiduciary duty. It doesn't even have to be willful or knowing. It can be negligent. And again, breach of fiduciary duty, <laughs> fiduciary duty, excuse me, um, that very well it will not be covered by uh, your DNO insurance, or it's likely not covered. Mandatory reserves and developer controlled associations. So previously, a developer prior to turnover of an association to the non-developer owners could waive reserves. Now it provides that the developer control association may not vote to waive reserves or reduce the funding of the reserves. Previously, they could. I also want to, I'm not sure which slide it's on, but I'm going to mention it now. The items that are in the SERS, there's one through, no, actually one through 10, 10 being kind of the catch-all at the bottom. The, the, after December 31st, 2024, an association cannot vote to waive or reduce the funding of those reserves, the SERS reserves, and nor can the owners vote to use those reserves for other purposes. So those structural reserves, they're in that structural integrity uh, reserve report. After the end of next year, the association cannot, again, I'm gonna say this again, it's important, cannot vote to waive them, cannot vote to partially fund them, um, and cannot vote to use them for other purposes. The official records of your association, condominium and cooperative, include the structural integrity reserve study, the financial reports of the condominium, and a copy of your milestone inspection, and any other inspection report relating to the structural or safety inspection of the condominium or cooperative property. So in my opinion, if you're having concrete restoration done, and you have an inspection report done by an engineer that's related to the structural integrity of the building and that has to be kept as part of your official records it should be anyway but now it's codified in addition 
to the right to inspect and then copy the declaration bylaws and rules, tenants or renters also have a right to inspect the milestone inspection reports as well as the structural integrity reserve study reports. So not just owners can get these, but if tenants, lessees ask for them, they have to be provided access to them as well. The structural integrity reserve study must be maintained for at least 15 years after the study is completed, in addition to all other inspection reports, including the milestone inspection report. Um, all the other reports dealing with the uh, structural condition of the property must also be maintained for at least 15 years in, your, in the official records. The websites, I think we mentioned this before, but in, in addition to other posting requirements, the inspection reports, which we just described and any other inspection report uh, the, regarding the structural or, or life safety of the condominium property, as well as your most recent structural integrity reserve uh, study must be posted on the association's website. What about the jurisdiction of the division of condominiums, timeshares and mobile homes? Well, prior to turnover or pre-turnover, they have jurisdiction regarding compliance with rules concerning construction, sale, leasing, ownership, operation, and management of the of the uh, of the units, as well as regarding the procedural completion of the milestone. After turnover has occurred, then, in other words, after the turnover to the owners, uh, owner controlled association, the the uh, the division has jurisdiction to investigate complaints related to only only related to financial issues elections, and the maintenance of uh, unit owner access to association records, excuse me, maintenance of and owner access to association records, and the procedural completion of the structural integrity reserve study. Interestingly, not the milestone there. I think this is going to be changed in the upcoming legislation. Don't know that for sure. I don't like to talk about pending litigation because it gets confusing. Just for the time being, realize that division they have jurisdiction regarding the procedural completion of the structural integrity reserve study on a post turnover association. On or before January 1st of this year, condominium kind of associations were required, at least those existing on or before July 1st, 2022, were required to provide the division certain information, uh, either by commercial delivery, United States mail, email, or hand delivery. Um, the number of buildings on the condominium property that are three stories or more, the number of units, total number of units in all these buildings, the addresses of these buildings, and the counties in which these buildings are located. The association must provide an update in writing to the division if there are any changes to this information uh, within six months after the change. Sellers. Someone in your building, someone in your condominium, I, I should say, selling their unit as part of the sales process, the seller of a unit, cooperative or condominium, and, and the um, developer must provide to the purchaser a copy of the inspector prepared summary of the milestone inspection report or reports if you're phase one and phase two, and a copy of the association's most recent structural integrity reserve study or a statement that the association has not completed the structural integrity reserve study. Again, acquirement of the seller of a unit. Now, moving off from milestone inspections and structural integrity reserve studies, we're now gonna move into the operational aspects of an association, at least some of the aspects, operational aspects. We're gonna start with budgets and financial reporting. The board must annually prepare a budget. That budget has two components, operating and reserve. So it must include the estimated revenues, operating costs, and reserves for the upcoming fiscal year. Operating, just as the term implies, is your day-to-day -day operating, whether that's office supplies, salaries, management fees, taxes, utilities, those kind of things. The budget adopted by the board must be adopted by the board at a properly noticed board meeting. Uh, that board meeting needs, it needs at least a 14-day notice, another 14-day notice requirement, uh, sent to the owners along with a copy of the budget. The budget must be adopted at least 14 days prior to the start of the association's fiscal year. And as I mentioned, you have to give 14 days written notice to the owners uh, with a copy of the proposed budget. And again, the person providing that notice on behalf of the association must sign an affidavit indicating that the budget was sent out timely, along with the notice of the meeting. If the board decides to make changes to that budget, 
you know, at the budget meeting, they can without having to re-notice the whole meeting. Financial reports, okay, or your annual financial report. Within 90 days after the end of the fiscal year, the association must prepare and complete or contract for the preparation and completion of a financial report for the preceding year. Within 21 days after the final after the report is prepared, but not later than 120 days uh, after the end of the fiscal year, the association must, must mail or hand deliver to every owner a copy of the annual financial report or notice that it's available to the owner without charge within five business days of the owner sending a written request uh, written request to receive a copy of it. An owner may provide written notice to the division that the association did not send them a copy of the report within five days after asking for it. If the division agrees with the owner, they send written notice to the association that they must <clears throat> mail or hand deliver a copy of it to the owner within five business days after the receipt of that notice. An association that fails to comply with their request is then precluded from waiving the report. Um, in the event the association fails to comply with an order of the division to provide an owner a copy of the annual financial report within the, within the specified time period, then the association is prohibited from waiving the requirement for that year, for that fiscal year for which the report was done, and for the following year. Now, what kind of report do you have to do other than if your bylaws or articles or deck require a certain level of reporting? Okay, absent that, okay, you know, it's if, if, if your documents say you must have an audit, then you must have an audit, even if you, know, you don't fall within these categories. Otherwise, if your association has annual revenues of 150,000 or more, but less than 300,000, it's a compilation or a compiled financial statement. If your revenues, if your total annual revenues are 300,000, but less than 500,000, then it's a review. And if your annual revenues are, are 500,000 or more, then it's an audit. For a smaller association, if you have annual revenues of less than 150,000, it's you're only you're only required to do a report of cash receipts and expenditures. Now the board can decide to raise that level. In other words, they can decide to have a review done rather than a compilation, or an audit done rather than a review or a compilation. Or you can have your owners, you can give the owners the option to vote to lower the level of reporting. So the, you can have the owners vote to have a, uh, a compilation done rather than a review or have a compilation done rather than a review or an audit, you know, go all the way down the line. But that meeting at which the owners vote to have a lesser review done uh, all the way down to cash receipts and expenditures must occur before the end of the fiscal year for which the report is to be prepared. And it's effective only for that fiscal year in which the vote is taken although you may make the approval effective for the following year as well, the following fiscal year. Transfer fees. A lot of talk about transfer fees in terms of how much can you charge with respect to a unit that is sold or leased. Um, you know, certain things are not transfer fees for the purpose of the transfer fee statute. Amounts that are uh, payable to an association pursuant to declaration or covenant uh, stopple uh, fees for stopple cer certificates, um, uh, uh, certain other things. However, for condominiums, though, I'm going to jump to 718.112.2i because this is very important. A condominium association cannot charge a fee. It's a typo on the report on the screen there. A condominium association cannot charge a fee in connection with the sale, mortgage, lease, or sublease, or other transfer, unless the association is required under the documents to approve that transfer and a fee for such approval is provided for in the declaration articles or bylaws. The fee cannot exceed $150 per applicant other than a husband and wife or a parent dependent child. This used to be $100 for years and years. And it was just recently raised to $150 uh, per applicant. But again, remember spouses considered one applicant, parent dependent child considered one applicant. And with respect to a lease, if you're having a renewal of a lease with the same lessee or lessees, no charge can be made. In addition to security deposit, if your declaration of bylaws authorize or so provide, you can also require the lessee to place a security deposit, not more than one month's rent, you know, the rent for that unit, 
into an escrow account maintained by the association. That's to protect against damage to the common elements or the association property. And, and that security deposit must be handled in the same manner that security deposits are handled under the Landlord Tenant Act, a residential part of the, uh, of the Landlord Tenant Act, which is part two of chapter 83, Florida statutes. Estoppel certificates, also very important. And estoppel certificates basically is when a unit is being sold or transferred, um, typically you're going to get a request from the buyer or their attorney or their mortgage company requesting certain estoppel in, in, in information. Within 10 business days of receiving one of these requests, you must respond and you must provide certain information. Uh, you must designate on your on the website a person or entity with a, with a street or email address for receipt of who's going to accept these uh, uh, estoppel requests, estoppel certificate requests on behalf of the association. These certificates must be completed by a board member, an authorized agent, or authorized representative of the association, including um, any authorized agent, representative, or employee of your management company. The estoppel certificates must be provided by hand delivery, regular mail, or email. For whatever reason, they left facsimile off the list. So it must be hand delivery, regular mail, or email on the date of issuance. The estoppel certificate must be signed by an officer or authorized agent of the association. What goes into the estoppel? Or what's the information that you have to provide? The date of issuance, which is very important. I'll explain in a minute. The name of the unit owner, as shown in the books and records of the association. The unit number or designation and address. If there's a parking space uh, assigned to that unit, that has to be reflected or garage space. If the unit is in collections, then you have to have the attorney's name and contact information at that, again, if the account's delinquent and being handled by the attorney. The fee, we'll get the fees in a second, for preparing it and delivering it in the name of the requesting party. Now, here's the real meat of what goes into the estoppel certificate which is the assessment information. The amount of the regular periodic assessment, meaning your monthly or quarterly maintenance assessment, levied against the unit and the frequency of the assessment. Again, the amount and frequency, monthly, quarterly, whatever. Well, it must be monthly or quarterly. The date that the regular assessment is paid through. In other words, what are they current through? The date of the next installment of the regular assessment. Um, that's due and the amount. Okay, so the next month, the next quarter, the date due and the amount. Itemized list of all assessments, special assessments, and other monies owed on the date of issuance by the owner of the unit. Okay, so well, what are they delinquent? What do they owe as of the date that you're issuing it? And then finally here, an itemized list of any additional assessments, special assessments, and other money or monies that are scheduled to become due for each day after the date of issuance for the effective period of the estoppel certificate. And by the way, the effective period is going to be either 30 or 35 days, depending on how that estoppel certificate is delivered. And we'll talk about that in a second. In calculating the amounts that are scheduled to become due, the association may assume that any delinquent amounts will remain delinquent during the effective period of the estoppel certificate. What else goes in there? Whether there's any capital contribution fee, which in my opinion, there can't be because you can only charge a transfer fee, resale fee, transfer fee, and other fees due, and the type and the amount of the fee. Whether there is any open violation of a rule or regulation noticed previously, previously excuse me, to the owner of the unit. This is important because if there's an open violation and you don't put it on the estoppel, then the next owner can say, what violation? You didn't tell me that this unit was in violation or how it was. So if you've noticed the prior owner, let the next owner know about that open violation that hasn't been cured yet. Whether your documents applicable to the unit being transferred require approval of the board. And if so, has the board approved the transfer of the unit to the buyer or to the transferee? Whether there was a first right of refusal provided to members or the association. If so, whether that right of first refusal has been exercised. A list and contact information for all other associations for which the owner is a member could be a master association. If so, identify it. And contact information for all insurance maintained. Usually that'll be the insurance agent or agents that are handling the association's insurance. Now, how much can you charge for the fee for producing the estoppel certificate? And there's a schedule. 
you can charge up to $250 on the date it's issued if the unit is not delinquent. So if the unit's current, $250. If the unit's delinquent, you can charge an additional $150 for preparing the estoppel certificate. If the person or the party wants it on an expedited basis, because <clears throat> say the closing is coming up soon and they need this right away. In order to provide an expedited one within three business days after the request, because normally it's 10 business days to produce it, you can charge an additional $100. Importantly, in order to charge the fee, the authority to do so must be established by a written resolution adopted by the board or provided or set forth by a written management, bookkeeping, or maintenance contract. So what happens if you don't provide the estoppel certificate within the 10 business days? If it's late, then you waive the ability to charge that fee. You cannot charge the fee if you don't provide the estoppel certificate within the 10 business days of receipt of the request. I mentioned the effective period, very important because you have to disclose on there what is coming due within the next 30 or 35 days, and that's the period. If the estoppel is delivered, the estoppel certificate is delivered by hand delivery or email, it has a 30-day effective period. If it's done by regular mail, then it's 35 days to take into account you know, the mailing time for regular mail. If additional information or, the, or you become aware of a mistake with respect to the estoppel certificate and you know about it within the effective period, you can produce an amended estoppel certificate. And that can be delivered uh, if the sale hasn't been completed or closed yet. Crucial, if you forgot to put something on there that's due or that's coming due within that time period, prepare an amended estoppel certificate. You can't charge for it and that's okay, but you'll know why in a second, why you got to do it. An amended estoppel must be delivered on the date of issuance and a new 30 or 35 day period begins. Crucially, at the bottom of the screen here, an association waives the right to collect any money owed in excess of the amount specified in the estoppel certificate from any person who in good faith relies upon the estoppel certificate and from that person's successor in a sign. So in essence, if you don't indicate on that estoppel that this unit was delinquent or that a $5,000 special assessment is coming due in the next 10, 15, or 20 days within that effective period, in other words, and you don't put it on the estoppel, then the new, no, the new owner is not liable to pay it because they're relying upon that estoppel certificate as to whether this unit is current and how much is coming due within the next 30 or 35 days, depending upon how that estoppel was delivered. So. If you don't, it's either put it on there or, or lose it. So it's very, very important that the estoppel certificate be properly prepared and capture the monies that are owed to the association or are coming due within the effective period. Now, let's say the sale doesn't happen, okay? Then what happens? Well, if the sale or the mortgage doesn't happen uh, and no later than 30 days after the closing date, the preparer, meaning the association, receives a written request, accompanied by documentation, reasonable documentation, that the sale did not occur from the payor that is not the owner, then you have to refund the fee. So basically, if you get notice that, hey, the sale didn't close, the, the refinancing didn't occur, whatever, then you have to give the money back. The refund, though, is the obligation of the owner of the unit. And you can collect it from that owner in the same manner as an assessment. All right? So you have to refund the fee, and then you can charge the owner uh, the cost of that, and that's an assessment against that owner's unit. Let's say you get a request for other information, stuff that's not required to be set forth in the estoppel certificate. Well, you can, you're not required, but you can uh, provide that information and you can charge a fee for it. Now that charge basically cannot exceed $150 plus the reasonable cost of photocopying and any attorney's fees. So if they're asking you issues that really the attorney should be answering, uh, information that the attorney should be providing, then the attorney's fees for assisting you in providing that response can be charged to the party who's requesting it. Now, crucially important, uh, at the bottom there, an association and its agent are not liable for providing information in good faith pursuant to a written request if the person providing the information uh, includes a written statement in substantially the following form, which is written there in italics. 
The responses herein are made in good faith and to the best of my ability as to their accuracy. That must be included on any of these responses that you give to stuff beyond the estoppel information that someone's requesting to protect yourselves from liability in case there's an error in the information that you gave, an inadvertent error. Conflict of interest. I am going to actually go by this. Uh, basically, with a conflict of interest, you have to disclose it. If you're a director and the association is going to enter into a transaction with you or any business that you or uh, a relative are financially involved with, basically, that has to be disclosed before it gets approved. Uh, it's a two-thirds vote of the, of the directors to approve this interested type of transaction. Um, and there's penalties if it's not disclosed uh, to the board. Uh, but there's some other things I want to talk about that I think are a little more important. So in my discretion, that's what I'm going to do because I have the mouse. Meeting minutes. I skipped by to the meeting minutes because this is something I think is a little more practical as well as some other things that I'm going to talk about here in that all board meetings must have minutes. The minutes do not have to be verbatim records, nor should they be. Every cough, every hiccup, every other bodily noise that should not be in the minutes. The minutes should just be a reflection of the business that was taken at the meeting or the business that was done at the meeting. Uh, you have to maintain minutes now permanently, okay, among the official records of the association. Uh, but what goes in those minutes should be what directors are in attendance, person or remotely, um, who made a motion, what is the motion, who seconded the motion, and what was the vote on that motion in terms of yes or no for every director or abstention. Outgoing board members are required to return all their uh, association property within five days to the association. Uh, an outgoing board member or committee member who willfully and only fails to do that is subject to penalties imposed by the division. Access to units. The association has the irrevocable right of access to each unit during reasonable hours when necessary for the maintenance and repair of any common elements or any portion of a unit the association is responsible for under the declaration or as necessary to prevent damage to the common elements or to a unit. Uh, I would advise give advance notice though, okay? If, by the way, if you haven't done it, I think it's a good idea to adopt the rule authorizing or requiring owners to provide you keys to their units. Those rules are enforceable. You've got to be careful though with those keys. <clears throat> you have to make sure that they are secure, but those rules requiring owners to give you a key are enforceable. You also have a right to go into abandoned units. Uh, an abandoned unit basically is a unit that's under foreclosure and no attendant has appeared to have lived in the unit for four consecutive weeks without prior notice to the association, or no tenant appears to have lived in the unit for two consecutive months without prior notice, and the association is unable to contact the owner or determine the owner's whereabouts after reasonable effort. Prior to entering an abandoned unit, the condom association must send two days written notice of its intent to enter the unit to the owner at their last known address, any costs associated with the abandoned unit are chargeable to the owner and accessible and collectible as an assessment. In other words, through your lien rights. You can't keep process servers out. You have to let them in. You have to let process servers um, do their business. They're officers of the court. Now, rules and regulations. I mentioned that a long time ago. In order for a rule or regulation to be enforceable, okay, it must be reasonable. What's reasonable? Reasonable means it bears a relationship, a rational relationship to the health, safety, and welfare of the association, its owners, or the building and improvements. Again, must be reasonable, and it can't conflict with any express provision of the declaration or any right that's inferable from the declaration. As I mentioned a while ago, if you're adopting a rule regarding the use of a unit, you have to give a 14-day notice to that board meeting posted and sent to the owners before you, that board meeting. Uh, also, don't assume the board has the authority to adopt rules. I've read many sets of bylaws and articles where rules are subject to owner approval or subject to a veto right of the owners. And there's nothing in the statute that says that that's not a, that's not a, uh, uh, a proper requirement or a lawful requirement. So you should check your bylaws, check your declaration, check your articles, 
regarding rulemaking authority, just to make sure that there isn't any requirement that the uh, owners have a right to, to also approve a rule. Material alteration, very, very important. Uh, material alterations uh, basically have been defined by, by uh, case law, okay? And that's where this comes from. It's an old case called Sterling Village, Sterling Village versus Breitenbach. I think it's from 73 or four. Um, means that as applied to buildings, material alteration or addition means to palpably or perceptibly vary or change the form, shape, elements, or specifications of a building from its original design or plan or existing condition in such a manner as to appreciably affect or influence its function, use, or appearance. What does that mean? That means if you're changing your common elements or association property in really in any way that's uh, affecting in an appreciable manner its use, function, or appearance, that's a material alteration, right? Um, and it's many different forms, changing any kind of color, changing the use of a room from one use to another, uh, making a game room into an office. Again, color changes, adding things that weren't there before, putting in paths where paths didn't exist before. There's lots of things basically that are material alterations. If it wasn't there before, or it's a different use, a different purpose, or uh, an appreciable different appearance, you know, you've created, odds are you've created a material, that, that will be considered to be a material alteration. Now, how are they approved? Under the kind of minimum act 718.113, if the declaration as originally recorded or as amended does not have a procedure uh, for approval of material alteration and additions, then you need the approval of 75% of the total voting interest, that's the total voting interest of the members of the association before the alteration or additions are commenced. Most declarations of condominium do have a material alteration section. Usually it's part of the maintenance section, not always, but usually it is. And usually it'll have a percentage of there, could be 75%, but it could be less. Could be two thirds, could be a majority, could be two thirds of a quorum, depends how it's written. But you have to check your declaration for what is the alteration approval section. Now, are there exceptions? Yes, okay. Through case law, there have been exceptions to having to get the owners to approve. Basically, the exceptions are is where the alterations and improvements are necessary to maintain or protect the common elements or the property. There's two pretty famous cases, Tiffany Plaza and Ralph versus NV Point. In each of these cases, the condominium was subject to erosion. They had it there on the ocean. They had an erosion problem. And one of them they extended the seawall. In the other one, they built a rock revetment out into the ocean. In both cases, these were things that weren't there before. Therefore, they're material alterations. However, the court held that since they were necessary in the board's judgment, reasonable judgment, to protect the property from damage, then they were not material alterations, but they were part of the board's maintenance obligation or maintenance authority. So this premise or uh, this uh, idea of protection has been extended to other things as well. Um, uh, well, I'll mention this quickly. Uh, well, let me go back. So it's been expanded to other types of, uh, uh, circumstances where you, you know, perhaps you're using new material, better material and more durable material, um, than what was originally built. They, depending on the nature of the material and, you know, things, other things that might not be a, uh, material alteration and would be considered just maintenance and repair. If something was originally designed very poorly, okay, and that original design is causing damage or causing injury or uh, or whatever, that can be changed out. If you're complying with new code requirements, okay, to put an enclosure around a dumpster or something, that would be considered maintenance and repair and not an alteration. You have to look at each circumstance. If in doubt, get an opinion of counsel, or opinion of an engineer or an architect regarding whether what you're doing is necessary or needed for maintenance, repair, or, or protection, and not merely an aesthetic change. Owners are allowed to also put out certain kind of flags uh, <clears throat> on their property, uh, and those are not alterations. The flags must be of a certain size, certain subject matter. Under the current law, you have to allow electric vehicle charging stations and natural gas fuel stations to be installed by an owner within the boundaries of their limited common element parking space. Um, there are certain requirements for that. I won't go through all the details, but basically the owner has to apply. 
They have to pay for it. They have to repair any damage to the property caused by the installation. They have to pay for the electricity. They have to comply with reasonable ar architectural requirements. They have to use a licensed contractor. Uh, you can require that they provide insurance for it. So there's certain requirements, but you can't preclude it. Okay, you have to allow it subject to these reasonable conditions. You also have to allow owners to put up um, satellite dishes, not greater than one meter. They can put them on their balcony, put them inside their unit. You can require they be installed in a manner that doesn't damage the property or cause risk of damage, but you can't preclude them. <clears throat> Again, you can preclude them to put on the side of the building or on the roof, but within their limited common element area or their unit, you have to allow it you know, subject to some reasonable conditions about the installation. Hurricane protection, you have to adopt hurricane protection specifications. Um, upon approval of a majority of the voting interests, the association can install hurricane shutters or impact glass or other things. However, if under the documents, the association is already uh, obligated or is already um, uh, their, their responsibility for hurricane protection, then you don't need an owner vote. The association can just do it. The board can operate shutters and impact glass or other types of co-compliant protection without permission of the owner, only if the operation is necessary to protect and preserve the property. Um, and notwithstanding anything in, in your documents, the board may not refuse to approve the installation or replacement of hurricane shutters, impact glass, <coughs> excuse me, or other types of co-compliant hurricane protection by an owner conforming to specifications. So in other words, the board must adopt specifications for shutters, impact glass, and then you have to allow owners to put those things in if they want, as long as they meet the reasonable specifications adopted by the board. With respect to shutters, that can include style and color and things like that. Leasing, okay. If you're going to adopt, by the way, leasing restrictions regarding uh, leasing of a unit in terms of duration or term or even prohibiting it, they must be set forth in the declaration um, uh, of condominium. Um, and when you do an amendment to your declaration, or if you do an amendment to your declaration, basically prohibiting leasing or uh, restricting the duration of a lease or how frequently you can lease a unit, those restrictions are only applicable to owners who vote in favor of them and to owners who acquire the unit after the effective date, or in other words, after it's recorded. If an owner does not vote in favor of it, then he or she is grandfathered and only subject to the existing uh, leasing restrictions, if any. But when that unit gets sold or transferred, the new owner is subject to the new restrictions. Use rights and voting suspensions, real quick. Um, you can find the authority does not have to be in, in your documents. However, okay, you do have to comply with the statutory procedure for finding and suspending use rights. You can't levy it until the board has uh, basically has imposed the fine, imposed the suspension, given the owner 14 day notice and an opportunity for hearing before the fining or suspension committee or grievance committee or whatever you call your committee, I don't care, okay? But the name's not important, but the committee must consist of at least three people who are not officers, directors, or employees of the association, or the spouse, parent, child, brother, sister of an officer, director, or, employ or employee. The role of the committee is limited to determining whether to confirm or reject the fine or suspension that's been imposed. If the committee does not approve it, it cannot be imposed. So they're like a little appellate body where they give a thumbs up or a thumbs down as to the fine or suspension. But for a condominium, a fine may not exceed $100 per violation, uh, but you can levy it uh, on a per day basis with a single notice for a for a uh, a continuing violation, but that cannot exceed more than $1,000. So if it's a continuing violation, it could be a single notice, a single op opportunity for hearing, $100 a day, up to 1000 But most importantly, or very importantly, you cannot lean for a fine. So in a condominium, you cannot lean the unit for failure to pay the fine. You can also spend their use rights, okay? Now use rights for failing to pay a monetary obligation. So if someone's more than 90 days delinquent, that can be imposed by the board. You can also suspend use rights for a non-monetary violation, but that's the same thing as fining, okay? We has to go through your committee or your committee has to approve it. Um, 
So, but board action, you can suspend the use rights of someone who's delinquent in any monetary obligation to the association. You, those use that suspension can be effective until it's paid in full. Um, that must be done by the board if it's going to do it at a properly noticed board meeting. Okay. And the board then must notify the owner of the suspension. Same thing with the fine. The owner must be notified of a fine or a suspension for a non monetary violation, <clears throat> as well as a suspension for a monetary violation or a monetary delinquency. Now, whether you're suspending an, an owner's rights for failure to pay or for a non monetary violation, it does not apply. The suspension does not apply to limited common elements intended to be used only by that unit, common elements needed to access the unit, utility services parking spaces or the elevator, which is a good thing. I don't think you want to suspend someone's right to use the elevator. Um, a suspension applies to the member, and if applicable, the member's tenants, guests, and invitees, even if delinquency or failure that resulted arose from less than all the units that may be owned by that owner. Now, voting suspensions. If you want to suspend someone's voting rights for being more than 90 days delinquent, you theoretically can, but <clears throat> they have to be more than 90 days delinquent. It has to be more than $1,000. And and if your condominium was created um, prior to July 1st, 2011, is when the law was changed to allow for this, under this case, which is Dusale versus South Beach Residential versus Dusale South Beach Association. Uh, going back to that Kaufman language I had before, unless your declaration has Kaufman language incorporating future future amendments to the act, if your kind of meeting was created before July 1, 2011, you cannot suspend voting rights um, of an owner for being delinquent unless your declaration gets amended to authorize you to, or that you have this Kaufman language incorporating the amendments to the act into your declaration. Because a voting right is a substantive vested right that there's no retroactive application of the statute to a pre-existing declaration without you know, the Kaufman language or amending the declaration. Uh, this is what I was just talked about. And in addition to the other things, proof of the obligation must also be, of the, of the delinquency must also be provided to the owner 30 days before the suspension takes effect. In enforcing your documents, you have a couple of different things. You can do um, arbitration, which is mandatory non-binding arbitration or pre-suit mediation. Election and recall disputes are not eligible for mediation, though, and must be arbitrated through the division. What are these disputes? A dispute basically means uh, any any uh, any disagreement between the association and, and the owner uh, regarding the authority of the board to require the owner to take or not take any action involving the owner's unit or an appurtenance to the unit, additions or alterations to the common elements or common area, failure to conduct elections, give adequate notice of meetings, uh, uh, adequately conduct meetings, allow inspections of books and records. These are all things subject to um, disputes, subject to arbitration or potentially pre-suit mediation. It does not apply to, okay, the mediation or the arbitration, to title issues regarding unit or the common elements, warranty issues, collection of assessments or fees or the levying of that, eviction or, or removal of a tenant, breach of fiduciary duty or alleged breach of fiduciary duty and claims for damage to a unit based upon the alleged failure to maintain the property. Again, I mentioned that you can choose either arbitration before you go to court or you go to pre-suit mediation. Pre-suit mediation is actually under 72311, which is the Homeowner Association Act. If you're to go to pre-suit mediation route, that means you basically have to write the owner the letter set forth in the statute and the owner has 20 days to select one of the mediators that you list in the offer of the pre-suit mediation, you must list the five mediators. Uh, the mediation must occur within 90 days. Um, if there is an impasse or the matter is not resolved, then you can file suit. Now, what's an impasse? An impasse is created if the owner okay, or the association, if the owner is the one who's, who is the uh, moving party, fails to respond to the written offer within 20 days. You know, we had 20 days to respond in writing and choose a mediator fails to agree to one of the mediators, fails to pay half the cost of the mediation, or fails to appear at the mediation. Or if you go to mediation 
again, mediation is not arbitration. Mediation is like a settlement conference. So if the parties do not agree on a settlement at the mediation, that so all these things are impasses where the matter is not resolved. If that happens, then the moving party can go to court. On the arbitration side, it's called non-binding arbitration because either side can appeal, you know, either side that loses, and the appeal is a new trial. It's called the trial de novo in circuit court. The prevailing party was entitled to their fees. Similarly, in the pre-suit mediation situation, if it goes to litigation, the prevailing party is entitled to their fees at litigation and at mediation. Official records. And I might get through this and maybe one more thing, we'll see. These are the official records. I won't go through the list, okay? The first five things there must be kept permanently. In other words, the entire time that they exist. There are certain records that are not accessible to owners. These are things protected by attorney client, including the work product privilege. Information that you obtain from an owner with respect to the, or, or tenant or protect or prospective tenant with respect to the lease sale or other transfer of a unit. So the whole sale lease application, all the information you get with respect to that is privileged, <clears throat> not accessible. Medical records of owners, personnel records of, of association or management company employees, such as uh, records regarding payroll, uh, suspension, discipline, health and insurance. However, personnel records do not include your employment contracts, if any, or the management company contracts, or budget that might show how much you're paying the employee or you're paying the management company. Any electronic security measures that is used by associates to safeguard data, including passwords, that's not accessible to other owners. Um, the software and operating systems used by your association, which allow the manipulation of the data, that's not accessible. Most importantly, this is when it comes up the most for me. So security numbers, driver's license numbers, credit card numbers, email addresses, telephone numbers, facsimile numbers, emergency uh, all this information, addresses of an owner, other than is provided to fulfill notice requirements, these are all privileged. I mentioned before email address, to the extent that an owner has agreed with the associates in writing that their email address is their address for official meeting notices, that email address is accessible. Otherwise, it is not. Now, an owner can consent voluntarily in writing to disclosure of its contact information or other information not otherwise accessible. If it's inadvertently disclosed by the association, you're not liable if the information was included in an official record of the association and is voluntarily provided by an owner and not requested by the association. Attorney-client privilege. That is basically anything that the attorney and the client, meaning the association board, all the communications back and forth between the attorney and whether it's email, letter, whatever, those are privileged, okay? It falls under the attorney-client privilege. The work product privilege is if the, is if the attorney has requested work to be performed or product to be performed uh, in in connection with some type of litigation, typically, in which that item could be an uh, engineering report, something like that, is privileged until the end of the matter for which it was prepared. And the board can waive the privilege, though the attorney cannot. The associate has a duty for the, uh, for the use or misuse of information provided, um, unless the association has it affirmed you not to disclose. Now, an owner can request in writing to have access to the official records. By the way, you do not have to send the owners those records. You only have to provide them access. You must provide the owner access within 10 business or working days after receipt of the written request. The official records are open to inspection by any member or their authorized representative at all reasonable times. You, can't, you cannot require that they give you a reason for why they want to inspect the records. A tenant has a right to inspect and get the associate's declaration, bylaws, and rules, as I mentioned a while ago, and they have a right to see the milestone inspection and the structural integrity reserve report um, study. The right to inspect the records includes the right to make and obtain copies at the reasonable expense of the member, and such copies can be made electronically and free of charge if the owner has a portable scanner, tablet, uh, <clears throat> smartphone, they can use those to photograph or, you know, the records and you cannot charge them for doing that. Um, you can, and I suggest that you do adopt reasonable rules, reasonable rules 
regarding the frequency, time, location, notice, and manner of record inspection and copying. What happens if you fail to provide them? If you fail to provide them, okay, that creates a rebuttable presumption that you willfully have failed to comply. In that, in that uh, event or, or, or in that circumstance, the owner is, is entitled to their actual damages, if any, or the minimum damages. The minimum damages are $50 a day per calendar day, up to 10 days or $500. That commences that calculation on the 11th business day after receipt of the written request. So don't throw these requests in a drawer. Don't ignore them. This is one thing the state enforces pretty strictly, pretty heavily, is the record inspection. Okay. The failure to permit inspection entitles any person prevailing in this. In other words, if they have to sue you to get the records, they're going to get that penalty plus their attorney's fees. Now, I talked about telephones. Telephone numbers are privileged. However, you can produce a directory of phone numbers along with the owner's names uh, and addresses, uh, official addresses. But any owner can opt out and say, I don't want my phone number in that directory. Email addresses and facsimile numbers are not accessible, as I mentioned before, unless they are used as the owner's official uh, address for their notice requirements. Emails, emails from board member to board member. This is actually, an ex this may be changing. There was a 2009 division case that said that an email from a board member to a board member are not accessible. There's another recent case that says that they are. So this is in flux. It's definitely a record from the board member to the manager or to the association's computer. Those emails are accessible. The others may be because of a recent case. Used to be no. And I know we're reaching towards the end. Yeah, we're getting close, but you you got through a lot of stuff today. That's good yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna let's see. I'm gonna do one more thing. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds and then good. we'll stop. And people will say, why isn't he stopping? <laughs> While Peter's tell, looking for the next slide, I'm just gonna, so everybody does know in the chat area is the link to click on to get to the evaluation. And then the, the uh, confirmation screen will then produce your certificate that you can print and save. But Peter, go ahead back to you. And folks, I will be back when Peter's done to go over the process on uh, printing the certificates. Uh, back to you, sir. Okay, the last thing I'm going to mention, because it is another one of those things that comes up a lot, is contracts and bids. Basically, your contracts must be in writing, particularly if it's not to be fully performed within one year for the purchase, lease, or renting of materials or anything for the provision of services. I would recommend that all your contracts be in writing, quite frankly, even if it's not one of those two categories. But more importantly, or not more importantly, but just as importantly, any contract for services or goods or whatever that exceeds 5% of your total budget, okay, including reserves, you must obtain competitive bids for those materials. However, you're not required to accept the lowest bid. And the exceptions to that are contracts with employees, with the, with the attorney, accountant, architect, management company, uh, landscape architects, engineers. Doesn't mean you can't get bids for these services, but you're not required, or these individuals, but you're not required to. Also, if there's only one source of that service uh, or that good within the county, you're not required to get bids. If that's the only guy in town, only person in town that has it. If you're a small association, you can opt out by a two thirds vote if you have less than 10 units. Um, and that's it. Insurance is important, but I know we're running out of time. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And I hope it was I hope it was educational. Thank you.